Marina Keegan was a writer of short stories, personal essays, social commentary, poems, and plays. She grew up in Wayland, Massachusetts, and attended Yale University, where she majored in English, was a leader of Occupy Yale, served as one of the youngest paid staffers on the Obama campaign, and organized panels on health care and homelessness. As a writer, she won the Meeker English Prize, the Orlo Writing Award, and Yale's Moth Story Slam. During her college years, she also won David Rakoff's Gilded Ink Writing Contest and heard her story read on NPR's Selected Shorts. Her work appeared in the New Yorker Online and the New York Times, and she's the only person ever to have been honored for both fiction and nonfiction by the Norman Mailer College Writing Competition. Also a playwright, her play Utility Master won Best Reading at Midtown International Theater Festival in New York City. The Opposite of Loneliness was Marina's final message to her college classmates distributed in a special edition of the Yale Daily News at the 2012 commencement exercises. She graduated with honors from Yale in 2012. Tragically, she died in a car crash five days later. The opposite of loneliness is called from her writing, a rich trove that Marina left behind when she died at 22, and her family, her friends, her teachers worked together to find the most recent versions of her essays and stories and chose the best to put into the compilation. And her words of inspiration have resounded around the globe, receiving over a million hits in 98 countries and transforming her into an icon for her generation. Her essay went on to go viral and with people indicating that they have been touched from the words of her essay, like let's make something happen to this world. And her readers have responded, taking up her challenges by making documented changes in their lives and the lives of others. Her professor, Anne Fadman, referred to her as a smart, exciting, stubborn, brilliant contrarian and one of the most exciting students she ever taught. And also a quote by J.R. Moringer, Pulitzer Prize winner and New York Times bestselling author, said, in her brief life, Marina Keegan managed to achieve a precocious literary mastery. Her wry, wise, lyrical voice is unforgettable, and her vital, exuberant spirit reminds us powerfully to seize the day. Though every sentence throbs with what might have been, this remarkable collection is ultimately joyful and inspiring because it represents the wonder that she was. And here today, Marina's mother, Tracy Keegan, is here and she will be sharing some of the legacy of Marina's writing with us from her book. So please give a warm welcome to Tracy. Marina's book um, is, was inspired by the uh, essay, The Opposite of Loneliness, which to be quite honest, she really wanted to be the commencement address to her fellow classmates. Uh, at Yale, you basically have to apply to do everything and anything, including be the person who reads the commencement essay. And as her essay was not actually selected to be delivered, uh, which she was very unhappy about, it basically did end up being printed in the Yale Daily News. And as such, um, after she died, it did go viral. And there were about a million and a half hits across the uh, world. And the response was so overwhelming that it was pieces of light in my darkness that led me to realize that there were no other options but to try and fulfill Marina's uh, wish to be published. And also the energy of the response and the cry for thank you for all the hope that her words have given us um, did drive the publishing of this book. I'm now going to share with you uh, I will say the book is divided into two sections. One are her uh, fiction pieces, and the other section are her nonfiction pieces. This piece uh, is coming from uh, a nonfiction piece, which is uh, about her experience with a car, with her first car, and it's entitled Stability in Motion. 
My 1990 Camry's DNA was designed inside the metallic walls of the Toyota Multinational Corporation's headquarters in Tokyo, Japan. Transported via blueprint to the North American Manufacturing Nerve Center in Hebron, Kentucky, grown organ by organ in four major assembly plants in Alabama, New Jersey, Texas, and New York, trucked to 149 Arsenal Street in Watertown, Mass., and steered home by my grandmother on September 4, 1990. It featured a 200 horsepower 3.0 LV6 engine, a four-speed automatic, and an adaptive variable suspension system. She deemed the car too high tech. In 1990, this meant a cassette player, a cup holder, and a manually operated moonroof. During its youth, the car traveled little. In the 15 years, my grandmother accumulated a meager 25,000 miles mostly to and from the market, my family's house, and the Greek jewelry store downtown. The black exterior remained glossy and spotless, the beige interior crisp and pristine. Tissues were disposed of, seats vacuumed, uh, and food prohibited. My grandmother's old-fashioned cleanliness was an endearing virtue, one that I evidently did not inherit. I acquired the old Camry through an awkward transa transaction. Ten days before my 16th birthday, my grandfather died. He was 86 and it had been long expected, yet I did feel a guilty unease when I heard that the now surplus car would soon belong to me. For my grandmother, it was a symbolic goodbye. She needed to see only one car in her garage, needed to comprehend her loss more tangibly. Grandpa's car was the nicer of the two, so that was the one she would keep. Three weeks after the funeral, my grandmother and I went to the bank. I signed a check for exactly one dollar, and the car was legally mine. That was that. When I, drove, when I drove her home that evening, I manually opened the moonroof and put on a tape of Frank Sinatra. My grandmother smiled for the first time in weeks. Throughout the next three years, the car evolved. When I first parked the Toyota in my driveway, it was spotless full of gas, and equipped with my grandmother's version of survival necessities. The glove compartment had a magnifying glass, three pens, and the registration in a little Ziploc bag. The trunk had two matching black umbrellas, a first aid kit, and a miniature sewing box for emergency repairs. <laughs> like my grandmother's wrist, everything smelled of opium perfume. For a while, I maintained this immaculate condition. Yet one Wrigley's wrapper led to two, and soon enough, my car underwent a radical transformation, the vehicular equivalent of a midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. Born and raised in proper formality, the car saw me as that friend from school. The bad example, who washes away naivete and corrupts the clean and innocent. We were of the same age, after all, both 18. The Toyota was born again. Crammed with clutter and exposed to decibel levels it had never fathomed, I filled it with giggling friends and emotional phone calls, borrowed skirts and bottled drinks. The messiness crept up on me. Parts of my life began falling off, forming an electric, uh, eclectic debris that dribbled gradually into every corner. Empty sushi containers, Diet Coke cans, half full packs of gum, sweaters, sweatshirts, socks, my running shoes. My clutter was non-discriminatory. I had every variety of newspaper, scratched up English paper, biology review sheet, and Spanish flashcard discarded on the seats uh, <laughs> after I had sufficiently studied on my way to school. The left door pocket was filled with tiny tinfoil balls, crumpled after consuming my morning English muffin. By Friday, I had the entire house's supply of portable coffee mugs. By Sunday, Someone always complained about their absence, and I would rush out, grab them all, and surreptitiously place them in the dishwasher. My car was not gross. It was occupied, cluttered, cramped. It became an extension of my bedroom, and thus an extension of myself. I had two bumper stickers on the back, Republicans for Voldemort, and the symbol for the Equal Rights Campaign. On the backside windows were Obama 08 signs that my parents made me take down because they were dangerously blocking my sight lines. The trunk housed my guitar, but was also the library filled with textbooks and novels 
at the giant cop tattered copy of the complete works of William Shakespeare and all 100 chapters of Harry Potter on tape. A few stray cassettes littered the corners, their little brown insides ripped out, tangled and mutilated. They were the casualties of the trunk trenches, sprawled out, forgotten, next to the headband I never gave back to Megan. On average, I spent two hours a day driving. It was nearly an hour each way to school, and the old-fashioned Toyota, regarded with light-hearted amusement by my classmates, came to be a place of comfort and solitude amid the chaos of my daily routine. My mind was free to wander, my muscles to relax. No one was watching or keeping score. Sometimes I let the deep baritone of NPR's Tom Ashbrook lecture me on oil shortages. Other times I played repetitive mixtapes with titles like Pancake Breakfast, Tie Dye and Granola, and Songs for the Highway When It's Snowing. Ravaging my car, I often found more than just physical relics. For two months, I could hardly open the side door without reliving the first time he kissed me. His dimpled smile was barely visible in the darkness but it nevertheless made me stumble backwards when I found my way blushingly back into the car. On the back seat, there was the June 3rd issue of the New York Times that I couldn't bear to throw out. When we drove home together from the camping trip, he read it cover to cover while I played Simon and Garfunkel, hoping he'd realize all the songs were about us. We didn't talk much during that ride. We didn't need to. He slid his hand into mine for the first time when we got off the highway. It was only after I made my exit that I realized I should have missed it. Above this newspaper are the fingernail marks I dug into the leather of my steering wheel on the night we decided to just be friends. My car listened to me cry for all 22 and a half miles home. I talked a lot in my car. Thousands of words and songs and swears are absorbed into its fabric, just like the orange juice I spilled on the way to the dentist. It knows what happened when Ali went to Puerto Rico, understands the difference between the way I look at Nick and the way I look at Adam, and remembers the first time I experimented with talking to myself. I've practiced for auditions, college interviews, Spanish oral presentations, and debates. There's something novel about swearing alone in the car. Yet, with the pressures of APs and SATs and other acronyms that haunt high school, the act became more frequent and less refreshing. My car has seen three drive-in movies. During The Dark Night, its battery died, and giggling ferocious, uh, ferociously, we had to ask the overweight family in the next row to jump it. The smell of popcorn permeated every crevice of the sedan, and all rides for the next week were like a trip to the movies. There were a variety of smells in the Camry. At first, it smelled like my grandmother, perfume, mint, and mothballs. I went through a chai tea phase during which my car smelled incessantly of Indian herbs. Some mornings it would smell slightly of tobacco and I would know immediately that my older brother had kidnapped it the night before. For exactly three days it reeked of marijuana. Dan had removed the shabbily rolled joint from behind his ear and our fingers trembled as the five of us apprehensively inhaled. Nothing happened. Only the seats seemed to absorb the plant and get high. Mostly, however, it smelled like nothing to me. Yet when I drove, my friends always said it had a distinct aroma. I believe this functioned in the same way as not being able to taste your own saliva or smell your own odor. The car and I were pleasantly immune to each other. In the Buckingham Brown and Nichols High School yearbook, I was voted worst driver. Now, uh, but on most days I would refute this superlative my car's love for parking tickets made me an easy target, but I rarely received other violations. My mistakes mostly harm me, not others. Locking my keys in the car or parking on the wrong side of the road. Once last winter, when I needed to refill my windshield wiper fluid, and in a rushed frenzy, I poured an entire bottle of similarly blue antifreeze inside. <coughs> antifreeze, it turns out, <coughs> burns out engines if used in excess. I spent the next two hours driving circles around my block in a snowstorm, urgently expelling the antifreeze, squirt by thick blue squirt. I played no music during this vigil. I couldn't find a playlist for poisoning your car. It may have been awkward looking and muddled, but I was attached to my car. 
It was a portable home that heated my seat in the winter and carried me home at night. I had no diary and rarely took pictures. That old Toyota Camry was an odd documentation of my adolescence. When I was 17, the car was 17. My younger brother entered high school last September, and I passed my ownership on to him. In the weeks before I left for college, my parents made me clean it out for his sake. I spread six trash bags over the driveway, filling them with my car's contents as the August sun heated their black plastic. The task was strange, like deconstructing a scrapbook, unpeeling all the pictures and whiting out the captions. Just like for my grandmother, it was a symbolic goodbye. Standing outside my newly vacuumed car, I wondered if I tried hard enough, whether I could smell the opium perfume again, or if I searched long enough, whether I'd find the matching umbrellas and the tiny sewing kit. My brother laughed at my nostalgia, reminding me that I could still drive the car when I came home. He didn't understand that it wasn't just the driving I'd miss. It was the tinfoil balls, the New York Times, and the broken speaker, the fingernail marks, and the stray cassettes, and the smell of chai. Alone that night, parked in my driveway, I listened to Frank Sinatra with the moonroof slid back. Now, how's my timing? No? Five more minutes and so Okay. So five more minutes. I'm gonna quickly read you the title of the the title essay, which is the opposite of loneliness, which is the inspiration for the book. This is this is the essay that Marina, as I said, really wanted to be reading to all of her fellow classmates, and so you guys get to substitute in, and I will read it to you as though she was reading it to them. As for commencement speech. The opposite of loneliness. We don't have a word for the opposite of loneliness, but if we did, I could say that's what I want in life, what I'm grateful and thankful to have found at Yale, and what I'm scared of losing when we wake up tomorrow after commencement and leave this place. It's not quite love, and it's not quite community. It's just this feeling that there are people, an abundance of people who are in this together, who are on your team. When the check is paid and you stay at the table, when it's 4 a.m. and no one goes to bed, the night with the guitar, that night we can't remember, the time we did, we went, we saw, we laughed, we felt, the hats. Yale is full of tiny circles we pull around ourselves. A cappella groups, sports teams, houses, societies, clubs, these tiny groups that make us feel loved and safe and part of something, even on our loneliness, loneliest nights, when we stumble home to our computers, partnerness, tired, awake. We won't have those next year. We won't live on the same block as all of our friends. We won't have a, a bunch of group texts. This scares me. More than finding the right job or city or spouse, I'm scared of losing this web that we're in, this elusive, indefinable opposite of loneliness, this feeling I feel right now. But let us get one thing straight. The best years of our lives are not behind us. They're a part of us, and they are set for repetition as we grow up and move to New York and away from New York and wish we did or didn't live in New York. I plan on having parties when I'm 30. I plan on having fun when I'm old. The notion of the best years comes from cliched should have, if I'd, wish I'd. Of course, there are things we'd wish we'd done, our readings, that boy across the hall. We're our own hardest critics, and it's easy to let ourselves down. Sleeping too late, procrastinating, cutting corners. More than once, I've looked back on my high school self and thought, how did I do that? How did I work so hard? Our private insecurities will follow us and will always follow us. But the thing is, we're all like that. Nobody wakes up when they want to. Nobody did all their reading, except maybe the crazy people who win the prizes. We have these impossibly high standards and we'll probably never live up to our perfect fantasies of our future selves. But I feel like that's okay. We're so young. We're so young. We're 22 years old. We have so much time. There's this sentiment I sometimes sense creeping into our collective consciousness as we lie alone after a party or pack up our books when we give in and go out, that it's somehow too late, that others are somehow ahead, more accomplished, more specialized, more on the path to saving the world, somehow creating or inventing or improving. 
and that it's too late now to begin a beginning, and that we must settle for continuance, for commencement. When we came to Yale, there was this sense of possibility, this immense and indefinable potential energy, and it's easy to feel that that slipped away. We never had to choose, and suddenly we've had to. Some of us have focused ourselves. Some of us know exactly what we want and are on the path to get it. Already going to med school, working at the perfect NGO, doing research. To you I say both congratulations and you suck. <laughs> For most of us, however, we're somewhat lost in this sea of liberal arts, not quite sure what road we're on and whether we should have taken it. If only I'd majored in biology, if only I'd gotten involved with journalism as a freshman, if only I'd thought to apply for this or for that. What we have to remember is we can still do anything. We can change our minds. We can start over, get a post back, or try writing for the first time. The notion that it's too late to do anything is comical. It's hilarious. We're graduating from college. We're so young. We can't, we must not lose this sense of possibility, because in the end, it's all we have. In the heart of a winter Friday night, my freshman year, I was dazed and confused when I got a call from my friends to meet them at Est Est Est. Dazedly and confusedly, I began trudging to S S S, probably the point on campus furthest away. Remarkably, it wasn't until I arrived at the door that I questioned how and why, exactly, my friends were party partying in Yale's administrative building. Of course, they weren't. But it was cold, and my ID somehow worked. So I went inside SSS and pulled out my phone. It was quiet, the old wood creaking, and the snow barely visible outside the stained glass. And I sat down, and I looked up at this giant room I was in, at this place where thousands of people had sat before me. And alone at night, in the middle of the New Haven storm, I felt so remarkably, unbelievably safe. We don't have a word for the opposite of loneliness, but if we did, I would say that's how I feel at Yale, how I feel right now, here with all of you, in love, impressed, humbled, scared, and we don't have to lose that. We're in this together, 2012. Let's make something happen to this world. up this crazy snow in April, which lands as tiny pellets on my collar. The turkeys have begun their mating rituals, and I am wondering where the you are. The <clears throat> lover that I should have had forever hold me as I watch the evening news <clears throat> Discuss the candidates and global warming It might have been less scary done in twos You left us in the middle of the story The kids no longer kids but not yet grown you didn't see them graduate from college, nor take their stuff and go out on their own. We didn't get to have a midlife crisis, regret our choices, start our lives anew. Of course, I don't believe that would have happened, and we'd have aged together just we two. So many things I wish that I could show you The way I've learned to fix things on my own The grandsons, one of whom looks very like you The kind adults our children have become The snow has stopped as quickly as it started from the yard and driveway mostly fled The little blue star flowers that you planted Are sprinkled far and wide beyond their bed 
I skip the evening news to write this letter To let you know wherever you may be That though you're long gone so long you're not forgotten And in my heart you still belong with me And in my heart you still belong with me And in my heart you still belong with me We welcome you to Earth, little baby, little star. We have awaited your arrival from near and afar. The morning rays give you a glittering crown of light. Oh, how your pitter-patter and ringing laughter give us delight. You fill our hearts with joy and pride that we were inevitably overcome with awe inside. Your gaze, blushing cheeks, and unfettered curiosity touch our hearts. They are an exquisite, silvery works of art. Already your childhood dreams are blazing and alive. In your infinities and unfathomables, you will thrive. Within the sea of infinity is a tiny forever that you will outshine and outpace, being successful in every endeavor. Be that person who strives to be finite in your own vicinity, blessed with talent, knowledge, kindness, and divinity. Be a superhuman who is never too afraid to go the extra mile. Someone who is not afraid to be emotional, never fail to smile. Don't be afraid to take chances, to be your own person with signature moves. Think lightly of yourself and deeply of the earth. Oh, your lovely existence will be precious as your worth. Thank you. and pear, apricot, then this.